you know, that. Good afternoon or good morning, everyone, wherever you are coming to us uh, online around the world. And welcome everyone who's in the room with us. We are truly delighted at the Centre for Legal Innovation at the College of Law to bring you this very important event on can we ever really be cyber secure? We won't ask for any response to that immediately, but we'll see how we'll go. We'll test it as we go through. Um, we are extremely fortunate to have, you know, really quite an amazing panel of specialists with us today. Uh, we're going to kick it off with a Q&A with them uh, and also invite your questions towards the end of the Q&A for folks here in the room, but also those of you online, you'll see that there's a Q&A button um, at the bottom of your screen. So please feel free to pose any questions that you have there. Um, and Christine, who is also with the Centre for Legal Innovation, um, will let me know what those are and make sure that we pose those to the panellists as well. Um, about an hour into this session, we're going to be flicking to Scott Jeffries um, from Continuum, who's going to do um, a live demo and discussion for us um, around all secret and scary stuff relating to the dark web and other various things that we often don't get to look at. Um, as I said to some of you before we came in, I don't know if Scott's going to put on a black hat for that or he's not. Um, but in any event, um, he's going to show us, in, in effect, the <coughs> other side of things that we often don't see. Um, but in relation to the front of house things and how it impacts our businesses, let me introduce you um, to the panel. On my very far left is uh, Nicole Murdoch, who is a principal with Eagle Gate Lawyers and also holds a number of other titles, including working at the Queensland Law Society, um, the Law Society uh, that is very uh, intricately known to us here because we're coming to you from Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. Um, and she works on the cybersecurity working group there. Um, welcome, Nicole. Thank you. Next to Nicole is Lisa Flatley, who is an adjunct lecturer here at the College of Law Queensland, um, who works with um, people who are going into practice and many others looking at areas around uh, risk management. So her input is going to be really fascinating as well. Um, next to Lisa, coming towards me, um, is David Williams, who is CEO of Fortitech. Uh, and David, I guess you get to see way too much of the stuff we're going to be talking about today. So okay. looking, for, looking forward to hearing from you. Um, next to David is Kim Trager, who is a Chief Operating Officer with McCulloch Robertson Lawyers and also a member of the Queensland Law Society Innovation Committee. And Kim's going to have a number of insights into dealing with uh, all of the things we're going to talk about today from a very practical level. So welcome, Kim. And last but certainly not least... Um, is Daniel Pearson, who's a specialist advisor in general insurance with Findex Insurance Brokers. And of course, a critical part of the discussions today is around this issue of insurance. You know, what do insurers want? Um, what do they don't want? What should you have done? And what do they provide? So Daniel, um, your insight is going to be wonderful as well. Um, so welcome to you all and welcome again to the audience online and here in the room. I'm going to jump right in uh, and kick off our discussion today by asking some things that might seem to be um, a little bit kind of, you know, already understood. But I was wondering if we could, and, and I'm going to look at you, David, of course, to start now, um, if you could define for us what is actually meant by cybersecurity. I, I suspect that we think we all have our own definitions, but what does it actually mean? Honestly, it's pretty simple. It is just business risk management, but specifically around your data assets. That's the information you collect on your clients, on your business processes, and those things that you store, both in paper and electronic form. And is it, 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 it I mean, I think a lot of us also think of it as just being an IT issue. Is that, is that fair, not fair? Well, there's really sort of three parts to this puzzle. You have the business owner who's accountable in the long run for anything that happens to that. They're the ones who will be, I guess, gone after by clients or government or whatever, if anything goes wrong. You have IT who are generally there to make your business more efficient, use technology to give you competitive advantage. And then you have IS whose job it is to look at the risk management side of things and provide, I guess, a bit of an overview on how to manage those risks. And often that's at the detriment to some of the IT efficiency. And it's those three that form that, that sort of group when it comes to looking after your cyber risks. So it sounds to me like it's pretty important that that multidisciplinary group is working pretty closely together. Indeed. 
Um, whether it's separate people or separate hats that are worn in the one firm, somebody needs to sort of step back and take a look at it from that perspective to make sure that they're covering it holistically. Yeah. And just building on that, if I may do a side question to you, Kim, mm. um, in your firm, do you find that that's how you kind of view cybersecurity? It is that kind of much broader remit beyond IT? Yeah, definitely. We have discussions at the executive level. Um, I think it generally it's driven by um, by our IT director and, and then by me, sort of have a bit more of an understanding of the practicalities and the risks. Um, and then we take it to them and say, this is what could happen. And uh, this is why it matters and why it's a business issue, um, not an IT issue. And um, yeah, having that conversation is a lot easier since we've had a data breach. So, mm. yeah. So um, no one can see any of you when I pose this question to you now, but I'm posing it to you and for folks online to reflect about it as well. How many have actually experienced a cyber security issue, whether it be a breach or worse? Okay, but a, we've got a few people for the benefit of the camera that are willing to admit this, <laughs> that that's happened. And, you know, how would you rate it on a scale of one to 10 in terms of um, now a priority issue for you, whether that's happened or not, one being the lowest, 10 being the highest? Anyone kind of around the one, two, three mark? No? Five, six, seven mark? Yeah. Ten? Yeah, so a few at ten. So varying kind of, I guess, approaches to that, but also varying degrees of concern and security um, issues, I guess, around that as well. So, Nicole, I wanted to, if I can, a lot of us in the room are lawyers and online are lawyers, of course, not all of us, but... I'm wondering if you might just give us a bit of an idea of what our legal obligations are, particularly in law firms, um, for cyber security, but also that broader aspect of privacy, because we've spoken, we've touched a little bit already on data. Uh, as lawyers, we've got an obligation to our clients to keep their information secure. It's not just personal information. It extends to information about their matters um, and even sometimes their identities and the nature of their matters. That's an obligation we hold until death. Mm -hmm. um, so even if our client passes away, we're still obliged to keep their information secure, uh, which is, makes us a bit unique in, in industries. Um, but it's we prefer not to consider cyber security as a whole. For us, it's data security mm -hmm. because it's really got nothing to do with computers. And sometimes when people hear the word cyber, they think, well, it must be computer related or it must be digital data or something like that. But in reality, it's simple conversations on planes. Mm -hmm. um, I was sitting in an airport lounge uh, a few months ago and someone was discussing very loudly on a phone their IT uh, protection regime. Mm -hmm. um, four points, he got uh, got very close to getting it right. But, uh, <laughs> Did uh, you hold up a scorecard for them? <laughs> I know his whole regime and I know what he's not going to protect. Mm -hmm. um, and that's about data security. The worst case I ever heard was... Um, two lawyers talking on a plane and their client who they'd never set eyes on was sitting behind them yeah. and they were yeah. talking about their matter or his matter but they didn't identify him but it was clear from him it must have been his matter because mm. of the details and they were talking about strategy. That's got nothing to do with cyber and mm. yet the whole plane probably learnt about that matter. Mm. Um, so it's not about uh, cyber anymore, it's more about data protection. I often think that with folks that are doing work on their laptops on planes. Oh. I mean, you can literally see everything that's mm. on the laptop and it's, you know, it's, it's frightening, really. Mm. And, and to me, quite amazing what they're prepared to put out there on their laptop with everyone looking at it. So It's not even direct sight of the laptop sometimes. Sometimes you can see the reflection in the window. Yeah. Um, and it's so easy for people to just pick up their phone and take a photo of that yeah. and then zoom in and read it. And just while we've got you on that, because, you know, I think sometimes the terms are used interchangeably, is there a difference between cyber security and data privacy? Or, as you say, are they kind of somewhat wrapped up together? At the end of the day, I think um, originally cyber security was computer related. But I think over time now, cyber security is a subset of data security. Mm. But people do use it interchangeably because they don't understand the nature of the terms they're using. Mm which is why as an industry we're trying to move towards a data security and information security mm. terminology rather than just cyber. Mm. And I think that also comes back to cyber insurance, mm. um, the troubles we have with clients understanding what cyber security is because they think that anything related to the computer must fall under cyber security, and it, oh, so, sorry, cyber insurance, and it mm. doesn't. Mm. Do you want to pick up on that point there, yes, Daniel? Yes, certainly. Um, yeah. So cyber liability has been around for approximately 20 years, so it's not a new new insurance product per se, but it's been put under the spotlight um, quite recent times with breaches 
also the notified data breach uh, laws that came in place two years ago. So it, it is starting to gain some momentum with business owners and, and people themselves. So um, there are other data, uh, intellectual property infringements and other insurance products that are, are related to that as well. So the cyber uh, space where it is in the insurance market, products have been developed further and further um, to be able to protect businesses and uh, I'll expand on that. Absolutely. If I may, I want to ask you a question, which is a question without notice, so feel free to, you know, um, tell me that. Yeah. Um, but are you finding in, in the insurance that you do in this area, are you finding or can you in any way ascertain, is there a good take up of this insurance in the legal industry? In the legal, um, also financial. Okay. Um, industry, so your accountants, financial planners along those lines, they're, they're very educated, mm -hmm. um, so they do take it on board. What we're really, really um, trying to focus is on that SME market mm -hmm. that may not have the IT um, capabilities of a, of a large corporation, mm -hmm. so it's about that education piece on a very technical subject mm -hmm. and making people aware of, of the threats and the exposures that are out there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So let me let me ask this question in a way to all of you, really, and that is, and I'm and I'm focusing for the moment, if I may, on the small practitioner for whom, um, you know, buying insurance perhaps may be quite costly. I'm sure it's not with your company, Daniel, um, and uh, and they're trying to kind of you know work out what to do. Some of the things that we hear from those folks is, you know. We rely, or we put it in the cloud and we rely basically on the enormous amount of money and uh, effort and energy that's put behind uh, keeping that secure from the people that we're working with. Um, if I may pose that question first to you, David, is, is that a reasonable approach or is it a scary approach? I believe outsourcing any of your risk to a third party and relying on them to do anything is not a reasonable rep approach mm -hmm. these days. You know, Microsoft is a great one. They will tell you they do not back up your data. You need a third party tool for that. And it's clear in their terms and conditions, but who's ever read Microsoft's terms and conditions? Also, you look at them, they provide the security tools and framework for you, but they require you to turn it on. So if you've never done it and you've don't know where to look, which most businesses don't. Mm. Even IT businesses aren't very good at these sort of things. Mm. Uh, you wouldn't know where to start. Mm. And just because they're providing the tools and they're giving you the option to minimise your risk really doesn't mean you are. Mm. And because you're expecting them to do something and protect you, they're really not. Mm. And they're quite brutal in contracting that out. I mm. mean, I've heard of clients who have deleted their Google tenancy by a click of a button and then gone, oh shit, what do I do now? Mm. And you can't go back. That data is gone once you've clicked that button. Mm. And they will quite happily tell you it's gone. And there is nothing you can do at that mm. point. Mm. And that's just a, a simple human error. Mm. I mean, that's without looking at the fact that, you know, everyone's data these days, you've got compromised passwords. Most of you raised your hands that you've had an incident of some sort. I'd correct that and say all of you have lost a password somewhere, whether it be Facebook or whoever's lost it on your behalf for you. Now, that's out in the wild. So now you've got the chance of being compromised. And what, I mean, any reasonable hacker is going to sit there and go through a list of the one billion that were out there, passwords and usernames, and go through those first to find out whether that's your one to get in. And if it is, they're going to then do whatever they normally do and ransom your data back to you because you value it more than anyone else. Mm. So the fact that you're expecting Microsoft to stop you from losing your password and protecting you, in the, you know, from a past incident in the future is a little bit, you know, it's not a reasonable stance, I guess, for Microsoft, and it's certainly not for you. It's your data. You need to value it and you need to protect it. By the way, the ransom folks, just kind of for your benefit, thank you for giving me a much more interesting life than I actually have. <laughs> um, so, and on that on that note, um, I want to I want to come back to you, Nicole and Kim, in relation to this. But Lisa, I want to jump in, if I may, with you now, and that is that we've spoken kind of about cybersecurity, data privacy, and risk. How does all of that fit within a risk management profile for? you know, if you like, the average law firm? Yeah, so I guess picking up on what David said, it is a business risk. So it, it forms part of an overall risk management approach the firm should have to every risk. And that is where you're looking at what the threat event is. So what could happen, uh, the threat impact. So if it did happen, how bad could it be? Uh, the threat frequency, so how often that risk event could occur, and then the threat probability. So um, how certain are we to the answers to all of those three questions? 
Uh, how you respond to that through tools, processes, preventative measures forms then the part of the, the security awareness program that every firm should have. Um, that framework, if you break it down, has five key things, and that's to um, identify the risks. So you're looking at what are the assets, what are they, um, what do you need to protect as part of your firm? And that could be data, it could be IP, it could be um, money, you know, trust account, funds, transferring. Um, and the more informed you are about what's happening in the industry, the better it is to be able to identify those risks within your practice. The second thing is then um, protecting. So what can I do to put in place safeguards to protect that critical infrastructure? It could be privacy of our data, client confidentiality, uh, security systems, access to that. Um, the third thing is then detecting. So having something in place that's monitoring what's happening in, this, in your systems. And um, I think the key part then is the fourth thing, which is how you respond. If you detect that there's something going on, there's unusual activity, then it's that comes into play then that incident response plan. And that mm. needs to address each of those um, events that could occur. It needs to have a key list of who's responsible for doing what and when, and also an up-to-date contact list. Okay, the first thing we need to do is shut down the system and I would call, you know, the first person on the list. Yep. And then the final stage of any um, risk management framework is then recovery and restoration. Mm. So what do I need to do to, to get back mm. um, the systems and the data in place? And so part of that incident response plan is who do I need to notify? So as um, uh, Nicole mentioned, it, there's obligations with our data privacy. So who do I need to tell? Um, who do I need to um, alert that this has happened? How do we manage the communication? And then what steps we need to put in place to, to bring that back to the status quo? And Nicole, to what extent is that, particularly the notification part, just picking up that last part, to what extent is that now mandated? Well, under the Privacy Act, we've got, a, so long as we're subject to the Privacy Act, uh, which it can be just by the types of data you hold, uh, we've got the mandatory data breach notifications now. Uh, and that also extends in some circumstances just to lots of data. Mm. So if we lose our server, um, we probably need to do a notification. Mm. Um, not that it's been compromised. Um, it depends on the circumstances. Um, and under the contracts, it depends on whether we're contractually obligated to uh, notify them. Um, I've not had a data breach that I'm aware of. Um, so there are two types of people, those who've had a breach and those who are yet to work it out. Um, I'm yet to work it out. Uh, so thankfully, but I, I think I'd take the honest approach and just say, look, I'm, I'm very sorry, but this is what's happened. This is what we're doing about it. Um, and this is the data that was compromised. Um, because at the end of the day, I've got a relationship with my clients that I, I want to continue. And... I would not like to be treated any differently. Kim, let me jump to you just mm -hmm. on that whole issue around, um, you know, I guess it, it, it's two parts. One of it is the immediate business continuity aspect of it, mm -hmm. but the other one is that longer-term damage control, and we've seen some mm -hmm. scary examples of that for law firms, mm -hmm. you know, as was mentioned earlier. Um, you know, for you kind of looking at that in, in your position, how do you how do you manage that? How do you manage it around those, particularly those two issues? So um, we we had a plan, um, data response, like business continuity, that sort of thing. We've got a range of plans. Um, it took someone to remind us to look at the plan when it actually happened <laughs> because everybody kind of freaks out. Um, what what happened to us? Um, is that we had a partner who received, or um, well, probably lots of people received an email. This particular partner clicked on it and put his credentials in because it um, it looked like an Office 365 um, password um, request issue. Um, and so from there, the um, hackers had um, his password and um, username, um, could access his um, system essentially, and uh, a whole lot of email uh, addresses that he had in his um, Outlook uh, to, and then started sending um, an email 
which was appeared to be on behalf of him. Um, he's a senior partner. Um, the kind of they, it was quite clever the way it was done. Um, uh, it, you know, it was linked to the area he works in. It was a project. You know, I think you'd be interested in this that sort of thing. Where a range of his clients would probably think, oh, that's interesting. I'll click on it. Um, and uh, he was actually doing a speech for my 25 year anniversary with the firm. And all these client, uh, all these people started ringing him. His phone was going crazy in his pocket as he was trying to do the speech because. The clients were contacting him and, uh, you know, and his friends to say, I've got this email from you, I don't think it's from you and you need to know about this and it mm-hmm. just it, it went so We then um, obviously had to deal with trying to work out what they had access to and what they didn't. Um, a, a concerning thing, and this is a tool I'm going to talk about, which I like, um, was uh, we have Mimecast, which can, which is a another sort of tab on our Outlook, which completely replicates our uh, email system. And we were concerned, well, did they access that? Because if they could access that, they would have every email that was ever in his inbox, whereas if it was in his Outlook, because we um, cull and archive things after 18 months or two years, it was a limited. So we were trying to work out what what mm. data they had access to. Um, we obviously had a lot of people calling on the phone, so we had to get communication out to our staff who were frontline to actually say, yes, thanks, we, we're aware of it, delete the email, you know, um, and, and we'll come back to you. We then um, had to do a communication, obviously, to people in the firm who were also being contacted um, and then obviously to the people who we thought um, uh, had been uh, had received this email and sort of telling them what to do. Um, trying to work out that what... Uh, what they had access to um, was was a quite a tricky thing, and that that extended over a period of um, of days. Um, we obviously then were thinking about notifying the regulator, which we obviously had to do, and the timing of that because we didn't really know what um, you know. Um, as I said, what what the extent of it was. We had two providers in our plan that we would use um, and one of them we discovered throughout the process was not as um, uh, perhaps good as what we thought they were, so we had to get another one. We also then had to get some forensic people in to help us um, with that. Um, So, yeah, a whole range of um, sort of steps, I guess, Um, and... Uh, yeah, it was in, in the middle of that, you know, you've got all these people that you're trying to coordinate and corral and make sure that there's the right information and then do we issue a media release and who does that and, and, and who's coordinating this whole sort of thing that's going on. Mm. So, yeah, it's it's a pretty stressful thing. There's lots of moving pieces. Um, what we have since, since it's um, happened, uh, we have um, we've done a whole debrief of it and what we would do differently. And, and um, we've got now a whole lot of, um, I guess, template comms based on what we had drafted previously. So we kind of already, we discovered that there were things that we did um, in sequence. So we were sort of, well, we'll wait till we know on this and then we'll do that that we could have been doing in tandem to mm-hmm. reduce the time frame and that sort of thing. So some practical mm. practical things like that. But having thought about it, having people that you can, experts that you can call and who you might contact mm-hmm. um, and, and having a plan I think is really critical. And can they step you, can they step you through that to the extent that you've now kind of learnt and established your own protocols, obviously, or policies, maybe yeah. both. Yeah. Um, those folks that you could contact or reach out to, could they have stepped you through that? I think there's different packages that those right. sorts of organisations um, provide, probably depending on on your business and what you're what mm. you're after. Mm. Um, and we also um, engage with another organisation separate to the the technical side of it, I guess, which was around trying to manage and assess the risk and the um, and then help um, help the people affected. So. The, the partner, obviously, um, there was a range of um, personal things that were, you know, sort of impacting him throughout this time as well. And and so um, trying to help them through that and then help the clients who ultimately, I mean, in the end, we had, I think it was about six people that we technically had to notify about under under mm. our, um, and, and send letters to, but obviously sent emails notifying the thousands of people in the, um, who'd, who'd been receiving the um, the dodgy email. Um, but there were six people who were to, who we'd, you know, technically had the breach for, mm. but then we went to the point of given the information they had, um, trying to help them restore the position. So one one was around a pass, uh, passport mm. issue. So we mm. were trying to, you know, and we offered this this mm. um, other support to them as well yeah. because it's a it's a reputational issue and a business Absolutely. issue. So you want to do as much as you can to kind of help your client through it mm. because it's sort of our fault for, mm. you know, putting them in this position. Mm. So, yeah, it's, it's quite broad, I guess. Like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, David, is that where something like this would most typically start, with someone clicking on an email? 
Yeah, um, the stats currently are 66 to 75, depending on who you look at. Um, breaches start from either a phishing attack or compromised credentials, so someone losing the username and password. Uh, as has been echoed by everyone around me, the biggest one is detection. Mm. Uh, if you don't know that you've lost your data, how do you respond? If you don't know what data you've lost, how do you respond? You know, as Kim said, the reputational risk is massive. If you've got a huge client book, do you go back to everyone? Do you post it on your website? Or do you have the tools in place to actually know what data was lost, who was affected, how they were affected, and go back to them individually to then notify them so that your actual reputational risk is minimized? And you know, everyone said it. You, know, you don't know what's happening until you actually have something happen. Mm. Now, look at the Australian Parliamentary um, Office. They lost 4,000 usernames and passwords of parliamentarians and were notified when the Australian Signals Directorate told them they found it for sale on the dark web. Uh, I mean, uh, that's that's our own government who sat there and was saying, we're, you know, here's guidelines on how to protect your data, but we're not going to bother following them quite yet. After that, they did change their tune a little bit, but uh, it goes back to the NIST framework and that middle term, detect. That's the biggest thing you can do, put measures in place to actually know whether you've lost something, what you've lost and how it's affected people, it doesn't even matter if you're not protecting because you can sit there and pretend it's not going to happen, but you wouldn't even know unless you can detect it. That's what the stats show. 75% of data breaches are notified by third parties. Yeah. So again, it comes back to reputation where the client says to you, oh, well, do I have to notify? And what if I just don't tell anyone? Well, you've got a 75% chance that someone else might notify you and that's going to come down to reputation. People are going to look at should you have notified, even though you might not have needed to notify, mm -hmm. should you have notified, mm -hmm. because it's your reputation that's on, at stake. Mm -hmm. So if we're, trying to, if we're trying to get people ready for that, and I know that, um, you know, some firms, for example, do this, they actually kind of set up their own um, exercise with pe to see how many people will sit on or click on emails and all of those folks who normally say that they would never do that were, in fact, the first ones to do it. <laughs> um, and then do training on it. So they, you know, it's an internal thing and they, and they train it. So, so how important is, is that, is setting up something like that or having that ongoing training unexpectedly, not announced, but, you know, just checking to see how people are going? Security awareness training is the number one tool in order to decrease your chance of having mm. a breach. Mm. It's as simple as that. It's a human element. Humans click on things without knowing. Humans don't watch who follows them into the office. You know, there's just so many ways that your data can be breached. Mm -hmm. And we've done you know, various audits and assessments and I've sat in a boardroom with no one coming up to me to, to say anything while I'm plugged into someone's network going through, you know, looking for what's there. Mm -hmm. And it's just the standard response for most people is to just ignore what's happening. Mm -hmm. But security awareness training is sitting there and going through and you know, sending out phishing emails to see who'll click on it, giving videos to say, you know, look for tailgating. That's when someone walks in behind you without swiping. Mm. Those things that most people sort of just don't think about in their day to day, mm. but should be. You know, it's that cultural change to looking at, you know, security is just a part and parcel of what you do. Mm. You know, it's, it's just part of everything. We all have passwords these days. We all know how to put a password in. We all know that we shouldn't use the same password everywhere else. And we all probably do. Mm. But changing those, you know, changing how we do that, changing that culture and having a look at it, valuing the information that we have on ourselves and on other people and changing that security isn't something we look at after the fact, but something we look at throughout that entire process. And businesses look at gross profit and profitability throughout an entire project. Uh, we look at what we're doing, we look at how we're running the business, those things come up, it's just part and parcel. Mm -hmm. Security is one of those next thing that will be required at every business level from boards right down to the bottom. Mm -hmm. It is just part and parcel of what we do. Mm -hmm. So Daniel, let's look at the insurance part of this. Sure. What you know, what will folks insure? What they, what won't they insure? What what are they expecting people to have done to be able to call on their insurance? Yes, certainly. Um, so the cyber liability product that I mentioned before, there's um, several different layers, and might take some. You'll hear a couple of these being repeated. Uh, so the incident response, so that includes IT, security and forensic specialist support, um, gaining legal advice and in relation to the breaches of data security. So that's uh, straight away um, being able to, to assist the business. Um, there's also the business interruption element, so costs associated with that, um, rectification of data as well as a result of the cyber event. So that's um, 
like you said, the, the profit um, that can be affected on the business side of things, they can actually insure against that as well. Um, Cybercrime, so your employees who often spend a lot of time in front of computers will incidentally click on links or mistakenly um, downloading malicious files. So successful attacks of this kind lead, lead to a range of issues and compromise of the cyber data. So that is actually covered under the policy as well. Um, and the big one is your privacy liabil liability, which uh, Nicole alluded to before. So that cover um, covers third party claims arising out of network breaches and notification of those particular costs to um, the end user or clients that have been compromised and also any fines associated with that as well. Mm. And are you, are you looking for people to have kind of the sort of templates that Kim was speaking to or doing the sort of training that David was speaking to? Mm. I mean, are they all important things from an insurer's point of view as well? Yes, totally. So under the Insurance Contracts Act, um, you've got the disclosure. So as long as that company has disclosed what uh, things they've got in place, um, the premiums will be rated accordingly. So you might not be doing any of them, but you're going to be paying a lot of premium, obviously, for your coverage. Mm -hmm. um, but if you are proactive and are putting those risk management strategies in place um, and you've disclosed that mm -hmm. on your, your insurance policy, then your premiums do get um, sort of calculated appropriately right. with the exposure. Yeah. So things like uh, education staff, for example, you're updating your firewalls and your, or, your, or your data, um, business recovery, Yep. So you're looking at business continuity plans, seeing what, if, how robust they are, whether they've been tested or not, mm -hmm. um, is another one as well. So mm -hmm. that, they'll actually take all that into consideration. Mm -hmm. I think, Terry, if I yeah, can just jump in. Please. The other thing um, that is really relevant is looking at what the policies cover because mm -hmm. um, when we were looking to get um, our policy a little few years, few years ago now, um, they're quite different. So mm -hmm. like any insurance policy, you have to make sure that what you what you think you will need is going to be covered by it. And it's mm -hmm. not, you know, just um, carved out for some reason or, you know, that's that's more, um, you know, that's a bit cheaper, but, you know, it doesn't do half of what mm -hmm. you think it does. So mm -hmm. then it's probably not that valuable. Mm -hmm. And I think, Kim, if I may just follow up on a question on that, because I imagine that it's almost like in some respects you find out what you need when the worst has happened. Mm. And I'm just wondering, where do, you, where do you go? I mean, and, and David, you may want to chip in here as well, um, or you too, Nicole. Where do, you, where do you go if you just want someone to explain to you what's going to happen so that you can start getting yourself ready, you can lo perhaps lower your insurance premiums or whatever the case mm. may be? Is there a little toolkit that you can get or do you just need to basically engage a consultant? Um, I think there's quite a few toolkits around the place on on various um, uh, you know websites and those sorts of things. There's lot, there's lots of information about this. The other thing I think is really just making yourself um, aware of what these things are. And there's so there's a lot of media um, around. And you know you start if if you start looking at this. And I've got a I get a, a feed every day um, on um, with I think it's cyber or something like that in it. Um, and um, you know th there's lots of things going on. Mm. For, and if you think about those different organisations, you can get a lot of information like that. I mean I think that. Um, you know, looking at the attack on Deloitte several years ago, you know, I mean, th those people were in their system for 18 months before they realised. Um, and they're, you know, they're an organisation that says, we're, we're experts in this stuff and come and, you know, we'll help you. So um, th that's a risk. We've got to, um, like like Nicole, people who are, you know, in that space. So you've got to sort of be aware of that. But there's a lot, there's lots of information that law firms and other organisations are putting out mm -hmm. um, all the time um, if, you, if you want to do something before you get to the consultant so mm -hmm. that it sort of reduces what you, you know, what you need to learn from them, I think. Nicole, is that something that the working group kind of is looking at or...? Mm -hmm. Yeah, tell us, tell us so, if you can a little about that. We've got a that. framework um, of scoring system yeah. on um, basically how to improve um, across various areas. Um, and I think it's, it's quite practical. Some are quite achievable for some organisations, some are not. Some, such as the use of universal keys, the use of universal keys for two-factor authentication uh, won't necessarily work for every application you've got. So you've got to take that with a grain of salt. Mm. But... Um, we've also got with Lexon. Lexon comes and gives us talks um, on cybersecurity and there's little act active little games you can play to see how with your pass. Um, but, no, it's, it's quite a good regime now. Um, and I think just over even the last two years, we've seen such an understanding come through now um, and a willingness of people to engage now. Mm. So I think we're, we're getting past that too hard basket. Mm -hmm. um, but there's so many now advisors that we've got. Like we mm. could call Lexon and ask them. Mm. We can call 
QLS. Mm. If we've got an ethics question, we can mm. call them. So we've got people we can rely on mm. um, to ask those questions to and to come and assist us. And do you think on that point where where the industry is kind of getting beyond the awareness, because obviously that's always the first thing, but actually getting into, okay, yes, we're doing some serious work on this now to protect ourselves. Are we are we still kind of awareness or do you think we've moved into the next category? I'm not sure we're in the next category yet. Okay. Um, yeah. What I'd like to see is we've got uh, ethics, of our CPD requirements, um, we've got practice management points. Mm-hmm. I'd love to see some cyber uh, practice management points. One of the things that the CPG points are meant to do are be refreshers. And that's all great if you learn it in the first place. Mm. But remember, a lot of us are older practitioners now. So some of us won't have had that cyber training mm. in the first place. Mm. So I'd love to see some systems come in where mm. they get some general understanding of even what an email compromise is. Yes. Um, because they, they don't have a concept mm. of don't reuse passwords mm. and things like that. Um, Mm. And I still get calls, not necessarily from lawyers, but I get calls from potential clients who want us to take action against the ISP because they got a virus. Mm. Um, And that's the level of understanding of some people. Mm. So we've got to remember that we've got a wide cross-section of members, Mm. some with a lot more knowledge than others. Mm. So I think we've got to get some of the members up to speed and then we can start doing routine hours Mm. per Mm. per year Mm. to keep us up to date on what the new threats are Mm. and things like that. And we've got the Queensland Law Society Symposium mm. coming up and mm. we've got a cyber security mm. event at that. Mm. And Lisa, I know that, that you do quite a lot of work with folks that are taking on ownership responsibilities of law firms mm. through the legal practice management course and your focus is on this and risk management. Are you are you seeing, is there a high level of awareness application or are you do you find that you're still kind of, you know, there with the basics, so to speak? Yeah, certainly I think I agree with um, what Nicole said. We're, we're still in that awareness phase mm-hmm. that they're not, um, you know, they're starting out their own practices so they're not um, part of that big uh, law firm where they've got IT people and mm-hmm. risk management people to tell them what to do. So a lot of the questions we get are where are the tools that we can just, that new practice downloading. So we're trying to provide them with as much um, mm-hmm. not only information but practical tools so mm-hmm. Um, incident response templates mm. and, you know, examples of emails that we've seen in the threat, you know, environment in the in the law society, mm. which they publish quite a bit. But, um, and Lexon do, having worked there, do a lot in this space. Mm. They've now got a cyber um, expert that can come in and do that disaster testing. Um, Almost a bit of an audit in a yeah, way. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Look yeah. at your process. I'm sure you guys do that too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there are lots of free things that um, are happening, but I think it's just um, giving them examples. We can tell everyone what a phishing attack is or ransomware attack is, but it's then, um, I was speaking to a practitioner and she said, I got it. I then had to work out over the weekend when I couldn't access anyone at the Law Society or Lexon how to, you know, buy Bitcoin to pay the ransom so that I could contain. And I think what she did was, panic obviously because she didn't have an incident response she Mm. could have Mm. you know managed that quite differently she is obviously well aware of that now so it's um being ready is the the biggest thing and having Mm. those things in place to okay if it happens this is the first thing Mm. I do and I wanted to belabor that a little bit and thank thank you for indulging that because I think that there are a lot of people in exactly that situation and it is going to almost invariably happen on a weekend. Yeah. Um, and, you know, being able to find someone that they can talk to is just so incredibly important. Um, and just sorry, just sorry, on that please. too, we're, we're finding and it, it's quite <clears throat> ironic, I think, is that there are a number of practitioners who are going into practice now on their own and are going completely back to paper-based. Um, yes. What, what do we think about, what do we think about so that? That's, that's, a, that's a great point. Yeah. I started my own firm about 18 months ago and I was using Windows uh, directories to keep up to date with everything and it just got far too complicated. Mm -hmm. So I decided I needed to jump in and use a third-party provider to do my client management as well as my document management. And one advice I always give to my clients is when you're going to engage with a third party, make them earn your trust. Don't just believe that they're going to look after your data. Do a privacy impact assessment on them Mm -hmm. or at least ask the right questions. So I thought, um, bite the bullet, I've got to practice what I preach here. So I sent the emails off to them and said, well, I'm not going to engage with you until you start to tell me this kind of information. And they sent back a confidentiality agreement, which I 
Julie signed and sent back and then they sent back all the data. Mm. And I very properly broke the confidentiality agreement by sending it to my cybersecurity experts and said, what do you think? Um, Mm. And they all came back with, yes, this is good. Um, And I was so pleasantly surprised. I really was shocked that I didn't get kicked back. Yeah. I didn't get any kind of response was saying, oh, but no, we're fine, we're fine, we're fine. There was no excuses pulled. It was, this is the data, this is what you need to know, we're secure. How do folks find a privacy impact assessment? Where, where does one go to this get that? why I had trouble, why I thought I was going to have trouble, because my clients in industry do get a lot of kickback from others because there's no understanding of cybersecurity. Right. But obviously these are legal service providers, so they probably have that extra level of understanding. We do get a fair bit of kickback. Um, And we get a lot of fear from clients not wanting to, say, write to Microsoft and say, well, what's your privacy? Give give me a privacy impact assessment. Um, But for our advice, it's twofold. One, Mm -hmm. we have cybersecurity experts like David Mm -hmm. uh, who go in and will physically ask the right questions and look at the data and look at the flows. Depends on how deep they want to go. There's different levels of ones you can do. Um, And then depending on whether they need to be privacy act compliant, we'll do a legal assessment on them to work out if the data coming back from David actually does qualify under the Privacy Act, um, such as deletion of the data and notification if they've received the uh, private information without being requested and things like that. Um, So it depends on the data being held is what we tend to find. So if it's going to be sensitive data, uh, the third party isn't too bad about it. Um, But if they're a business to business, the response, so we do a lot of work in mining and the response is, but we're not going to hold any personal information. And we say, you're a mine. Mm. And they say, yeah, but they're our, going to be our employees, so we're not going to fall under this. And at the end of the day, we, my, a lot of my clients do software for mines that's safety-based. So at the end of the day, we're going to be notified of safety incidents that aren't our employees. So there, there's going to be a requirement for Privacy Act compliance mm. there. Mm. Um, and in those respects, once you explain it to them, they're fine. But if it's business to business and they've got no concept of privacy, private information, they don't want a bar of it. Yeah. So let me let me ask all of you this, and then I'm going to open it up to your questions before um, we bring Scott in. Um, I'm guessing that probably all of you have some favourites in terms of your cybersecurity toolbox. Um, so, uh, Kim, I'm going to start with you because you mm-hmm. briefly mentioned one of them. Mm-hmm. Um, but tell us, you know, give folks an idea of what could go into that toolbox and kind of what they do from your point of view? So um, there's probably two things that I really, um, because this is a human issue and um, because our biggest risk is our staff, um, I think that if we can reduce um, our reliance on them getting it right, then that's a good thing. So two things. Um, One is a product called um, Vulnerability Manager, which looks at our perimeter and tells us when we've got um, particular issues. So, um, and then our IT uh, people can investigate those because um, it's too hard again to have a whole, otherwise you'd have masses of people sitting there all the time trying to to make that assessment. Um, the other one is Mimecast. And that, um, in addition to replicating your entire um, uh, mailbox um, that I talked about before, um, it actually acts as a filter to stop um, emails as they're coming in. So in our firm, and I just got the latest, um, some latest stats from our IT director. Um, so we've wrapped, 400 people. In November, we had 440,000 emails come in. Um, 242,000 of those or 55% were stopped as potentially um, a problem. Um, And of those, uh, 594 um, were malware um, detected. That 594 is a... quite a large number compared to other months. And I asked our IT director about that. He said, I think it's um, online uh, shopping, Black Friday, Mm. Cyber Monday, all that Mm. sort of thing, that people are there, they're seeing all this stuff in there. Um, So that's sort of a bit of a spike. But that sort of 55, 60, 65% of all the email traffic that comes in um, being filtered out um, is quite normal. And if if you think about the number of times you have to rely on those 400 people (laughs) to not click on something dodgy, um, that's a, you know, I'd rather have something like this in place to yeah. at least reduce what we're trying to rely on them for. Mm. So, yeah. And I, I, you know, there's a, there's one just along that 
line just for all of you. You could try it now in the room or online, but, you know, that one that's been mentioned many times before, but um, have I been porn, P-W-N-E-D, uh, and type in your email address and then be horrified about how many times it's been breached or compromised um, in various uh, locations. And if you have more than one email address and you really want to be depressed today, just type them all in and have a look. Um, it's really quite, quite amazing. Um, and thank you for that, Kim. David, I'm, I know that you must have some favourites. <laughs> About 40. Too many favourites, um, yeah. yeah. Honestly, there are two things that stand out for us. Security awareness training, whether that be automated or in person, just start educating. Mm -hmm. That's the first step. And the other one that's come up is the detection. There's a tool called SIEM, which is basically a log management tool. It collects all that information that's going on, the millions of things you said were happening, runs it through AI, looks for things that shouldn't be there and pops them out in front of a person. And that person then looks at it and goes, we have a problem. Mm. And that's the best way to find out something's been going on. Mm. Because as has been stated, the current, stat, the current stat is 191 days they've been in your system before they do anything. Before you're aware that they're no, there. Before they breach you. Wow, so they're just looking around. So yeah. they've yeah. been looking there for 191 days, going through your stuff, browsing everything, deciding how you work, looking at your backups, all those things before wow. they do something. Wow. And and you, you were nodding your head yeah, there. So um, tell us more things scary. to depress us, Daniel. I'm on the cold face <laughs> at the other end of um, when it happens in clientele. So um, we see them, and I suppose my favourite response, we've got a, a, there's an underwriter over in England um, they've got two, 365 24-7 um, incident responses. Um, Lisa um, touched on it before where it's you, you need some help there and then, mm. um, and that's where this tool comes into help. You've got internal stakeholders, so it notifies everyone internally within mm. the business, but also gets the claim and the, the response time um, ticking mm. over straight away for mm. you. So that, that's probably one of my particular mm. favourites um, mm. coming from an insurance background So and seeing these every day. It, it seems like the real keys in a way here are detection, hopefully sooner than 191 days, but then really rapid response is just critical as well. Is that is that a fair thing to say? And the right response. And too. the right response, absolutely. I think, as Kim said, that communication to those affected and how you communicate is really important. Yeah. If you take a knee-jerk reaction and tell all your client base you've been compromised mm. within minutes of finding out, mm. you may have reputationally damaged yourself beyond repair mm. quite quickly. Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think the other thing is it's important to tell them honestly, but obviously you've got to be really authentic about it, but, you know, what, what you know and, and what it is mm. and that, so for us it was like, we know that this has happened. It's one isolated email account. Um, you know, this is, and this is what you should do if you've received another email, mm. like practical advice as well. And we will update you again, like mm. what's going to happen next. We will update you again when we know more. Mm. Um, and then, uh, so I think there was three that we sent. Um, mm. The second one was, we'll only talk to you again if, if you if your information's been impacted, which was then the six yeah. uh, that we did. It's so that honesty. It and is. when you don't yeah. know, saying, yeah. we, don't we don't know, know. Yeah. but mm. we're going to find yeah. out yes. and then yeah. tell them when you do. Yes. Yeah. And it's all, do you think that people are generally more understanding of it's, it's no longer a question of if, but when, Correct. you know, for, for realistically. I have a feeling after yeah. you're going to go to, have you been porn, they'll be a lot more understanding. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll test, we'll test before yeah, we close. Really secure. <laughs> no, exactly right. Mm. So I wanted to open it up to um, some questions. We've got a little, a little time before um, Scott joins us. Um, may I invite you to pose your questions and I might repeat them, not because I can't hear you, but for the benefit of the camera. Any questions for anyone? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Nicole, I mentioned, um, so like, you know, airport and people are hearing. What about when you want to have, like, a special meeting at the cafe? So what does the cafe say? Well, this client wants to meet you from the cafe. That's not a confidential conversation. Um, I think that's the definition of not confidential. Um, you've so got not confidential room. if you're in a cafe. No. Yeah. Okay. Um, you've got to be. Um, you've, you've got to be in a closed environment where third parties can't hear you for it to be a confidential conversation. Um, clients will often say, "Oh, let's go to coffee and discuss this." Um, maybe they're they're consenting to that discussion, but you've still got to protect them from themselves sometimes. So it depends on what they want to discuss um, and what kind of information they want to uh, be released in that conversation. But you've got to understand that people will listen um, because especially if they think they're hearing something they shouldn't be allowed to hear. 
Mm. So should you should you then pose that question? Are we in in the day and age where the next question you should ask in those circumstances is, you know, if there's anything um, that you feel is confidential that we're going to discuss, maybe we might be better off having it at your this conversation at your yes. office or ours. Yeah, important to ask that second question. Okay. Other folks, questions? Christine, just checking that we haven't got any questions online. Why the folks are thinking about it? I'm sorry. Yeah. Are there any particular types of data that they're specifically focusing on? So the last time we had a breach, it was really chasing what I would call Microsoft applications, and it actually didn't touch our practice management system. <clears throat> so it was it was uh, general data we might have on precedents and, and other bits of features. Is there a sort of an area that they're targeting specifically that then might help us focus our risk management or our, our tools and techniques? <clears throat> it's going to so, come down. Oh, to one sec. I'm just, just going to repeat that just for the camera. Just one sec. So it, it's basically: uh, is there any targeting on particular areas for breach activity? Do you like that? Okay, we'll go with that. Sorry, go ahead. It's going to come down to how easy they can get that data. If everyone's using Office 365, it's a giant honeypot, which is means it's something that they can attack, and they will. Um, if you're using Leap as an example, it's a tool that's getting more and more popular or action steps. So there are things that now you move off-prem, which is or on-prem, we have it in your own server, which is a little bit harder to attack. You are now generally reasonably well looked after. You might have a firewall. You're one of many, but now you're moving into, say, Leap or Action Step, where you're many in one. And because of that, the targeting will come quite high. It's a bit like the Mac argument. I used to have a Mac because I never got viruses. Well, unfortunately, these days you're getting more of them than you are Windows because they know that you're a soft target and mm -hmm. they figure it out pretty quickly. These guys aren't stupid. They have access to AI. They are running it like a business. They are well-funded. They turn over more money than any other organized crime all put together. So they've got the money to spend on doing it right and targeting you. And they'll figure out how they can make money out of that. Microsoft's an easy one, so they'll go after that. But who knows? I think Leap and Action Step will be bits of software they go after next because the value of that data is high. And more and more people going to these cloud-based services means it's going to be more and more of a target. So let me, if, if I may, sorry, Kim, did you want to do a follow-up on that? Say, yeah. I, I think it depends a little bit on what they're after. Um, so that, um, you know, there, there's... Uh, we are known apparently for the amazing technology that is produced in Australia to do with um, mining, um, innovation, ag tech, that sort of stuff. So I, potentially if you are a firm that um, acts for clients in that space, then, you know, that um, equally um, we've had quite a lot of the, um, the you know, spear phishing where you've got someone... So. I, I send lots of emails telling people, telling our CFO that this needs to be paid immediately, and um, you know, well, this person's changed their their bank account and those sorts of financial transactions. So you can see those two things are really quite different. Um, again, on the the one that happened to us, I think it was the um, the clicked on email that um, they were then relying on by sending out another thing that said click on this, which was a project apparently from this partner, um, they were wanting other people to click on that and then, um, you know, get their credentials. So what that was, what they're after in those three scenarios is probably quite different. Yeah, so it makes it, yeah, it's a bit hard. So a couple of questions from online and um, Daniel, I'm going to pose this one to you if I may. Um, the question is that um, as the uh, threat landscape kind of expands, then some insurance companies have sought to create um, more exceptions or restricted payouts, and obviously it's a dynamic landscape. So how does one mitigate that beyond the obvious one that they you know, should stay in touch with their insurer and have lots of conversations? But how, how does one kind of manage that scenario from yes, outside? Uh, well, once again, it comes down to that risk mitigation, um, risk management. So being able to protect yourself hardware-wise, software-wise, there's different industries that we, insurers just won't touch. Mm. So that's things like Bitcoin, um, financial institution, large institution banks. Um, online gambling is another one. Airports, uh, they just stay clear of that. Mm. Um, but, for example, one of our underwriters writes up to $75 million, um, for the, the limits. Mm. So they're quite expansive limits. And, and as Kim uh, highlighted before, there are sub-limits within each particular policy. So it's always ideal to have your insurance broker informed. Mm -hmm. um, if you go into a new occupation or a different industry, for example, um, you may be susceptible to, mm -hmm. to a higher attack rate. Mm -hmm. Or if you have more business, uh, more turnover than more activity, that's another indicator mm -hmm. where they'll have a look at your premiums and, and adjust mm -hmm. accordingly. But you can yeah. write back and, and get excess layers on top of that. Um, you can have a look at 
indemnity periods and also uh, deductibles mm. to reduce the premium as well. But it seems to me part of what you're saying there as well is that it's almost like considering your insurer to be more of a partner in your business and, and being having that door open for those Discussion. communications yeah. all the time. Is that is that a fair comment? That would be ideal yeah. world for any type of insurance, um, yeah. but particularly this one where it's more complex and technical. Yes. Um, it's always dynamic and it will always be changing uh, environmental landscape, mm. uh, hence why I do like having that uh, niche in, in this particular type of field. Um, it's not going to die. Uh, and like we said in the question, you know, uh, are we ever cyber secure? I don't think so. It's just going to be one thing after another in mm. advancements in technology. So. Yes. And, and we've got another question that uh, online that I want to pose, if I may, to um, to all of you, really. Um, there's lots of, uh, you know, boxes where basically we are dropping various documents to share them with clients or perhaps we're sharing them with each other. So, you know, how do we, how do we manage that sort of virtual collaboration, if you like, but at the same time balance that with all of these issues around uh, privacy and cyber security. Um, Nicole, may I address that one initially to you? I, I'm not a fan of using Dropbox <laughs> or any of the, the like activities. Um, the only one I use is Objective Connect and that's because I'm forced to by IP Australia. Um, but I warn, when clients ask me to download something from Dropbox, I'll forward that email to them rather than reply because it might be a phishing email. Um, and I'll warn them that I don't consider it very secure and I'd rather they just sent me the documents um, if they could, so long as they're not too large. Um, mm. But I don't trust any of them. Mm. Okay. Um, other folks would like to comment about that? Just something that we're noticing with the practice management course is unique client identifiers. So having some kind of um, unique yeah, key that they've got that they can access. So it's either a client portal or something where it's just you and the, the client that has the number. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that we're hearing is mm -hmm. quite prevalent. David, Kim, any thoughts? Mine's going to be a slightly differing opinion. There's actually some really good points with using these services because you can send a link to someone and inevitably if you screw it up and send it to the wrong person, you can actually get rid of that link pretty quickly, which would be a little hard to do if you'd sent them an email and you have to recall it. They've already opened the previous one. Or even if the document changes and what you had in there wasn't correct and you've updated it, at least the version they're getting is the version you want them to see all the time. Mm. So there are some benefits. Even with Office 365, it tracks access, so you know whether they've accessed it or not. You can rescind that access very quickly and easily. And at the other point, you know it's them because through Federation, their Office 365 knows who they are mm -hmm. and you'll send it to them, so Office 365 ties them. So unless they're mm -hmm. already compromised, which isn't exactly your problem, you're at least sharing the data to them in a secure way that you control. Because there is this convenience, um, you know, kind of trade-off all the time, isn't there? Even with emails, for that matter, and accessing those. Kim, any thoughts from you in terms of, you know, managing this kind of virtual collaboration between clients or colleagues? Yeah, our um, our IT director tells me that Dropbox, the version of Dropbox that's currently around, it has um, is better than it used to be, and that there's ways to put security protocols mm -hmm. around it. We do have the client portals as well for particular things. Um, obviously, use email a lot. Uh, depends too, I think, on your collaboration tools with um, within the document management system and those sorts of things. So I think it's like a lot of things, it's evolving and the security element is um, evolving with it. Mm. Um, so probably caution, but yeah, mm. there's, you know, you've got to do business, don't you? Yeah, whether yeah. you've got a floor to hold and it comes down to whether you locked it or put your seatbelt mm. on. So if you've got a tool, use the tool appropriately and secure it and it's probably better than nothing at all. Yeah. There we go. We should be good now, Scott. Just if you would just mind just chatting and we'll check that out. Yes, perfect. Hello, everybody. Brilliant. So I work with um, David Williams, who's in the room today. He's one of my clients. Um, he engages with me for a number of tools that my company provides to him. And I have a general knowledge around the security problems that a lot of small businesses in Australia and the world face today. So I'm going to take you through a few things today on email compromise, the dark web, and phishing. And I will show you a real life example of how this can go terribly wrong if you don't be mindful about your online security. So, the world as we know it today is very insecure and people are not very aware of their ability to be 
compromised through what they know as behavioral mitigation. So people aren't actually aware that they're being farmed for knowledge through social media platforms, LinkedIn, Facebook, and many other sources of intel. Often a threat actor is going to watch you and follow you for months before they launch a campaign against a business, especially if it's a sizable organization. If you're an organization that has millions of dollars, they will spend more time getting to know you intimately in order to fool you into making them money off your bank account, typically through things like CEO fraud, CFO fraud. So this is me. I work for a company called Continuum, which is also a part of a ConnectWise group. Uh, We're based out of Tampa in Florida, and I work out of Sydney in Australia. Cybersecurity is not a new problem, but it is getting worse. Every year, you'll see an increase in the amount of attacks. The marketplace for cyber criminals is now valued more than any other illicit marketplace in the world combined. That does not matter if you're talking about drugs, weapons, prostitution, or anything else combined, the grand total of all of these things together is still now less than the amount of money cyber threat actors make every year. Some of these organizations are worth billions of dollars. They have 200 to 300 staff inside of a cyber hacking company. They have a board of directors. They have a HR team. They even have a help desk that will assist you in paying them money. This is the reality. Here are statistics showing you the number of complaints by the IC3. This is United States government. And what the IC3 does is purely collect intel about cyber crime that occurs that is reported to the FBI in the United States. Why this is interesting is the amount of complaints versus the amount of revenue and financial loss do not correlate. This means that more businesses are getting attacked but are not willing to talk about this attack with other people. They do not report this to any government body. In Australia, we have a notifiable data breach scheme. You would think that that would mean that businesses are gonna notify of a data breach. However, there's actually more than likely the chance that most businesses will not actually report that breach, whether it's due to the loss of their reputation, financial or compliance reasons. Probably around 90% of breaches that occur in Australia currently do not go reported. That means that you're actually gonna find you wouldn't even be aware that some of your data might have been compromised through breaches of your business partners, maybe your direct accounting, law, or other services firms that you engage with, and many other things. This is a list of cybercrime and the types of crime. So you will see here that the leading cause of loss is actually known as BEC. BEC is a business email compromise. So a business email compromise is caused by someone having had access to an account, a genuine account, not a phishing, but a real employee's email address. They are then able to use that to manipulate another person in the business to do what they want. They have probably been following you online for months. They know exactly how you speak. They know exactly what roles you are in your company. They know who you talk to in regards to authorizations to get things approved. They've probably watched your emails for months as well, understanding who your CEO is, who your CFO is, who the payments go through, how the approval process would work, the style of language you would use in an email to write and address people. This makes it extremely difficult for someone to identify a false attack email compared to a genuine request. Often these are in financial nature. It could be as simple as sending a client a new request for payment with a different bank account. 
or as complex as asking a CFO to make an investment or a transfer to an account from a CEO who might not question why their boss is asking them to do so. Items you could do here to reduce this occurring to you would be as simple as picking up the telephone and calling the person who has emailed you and verifying that that is a genuine email from them before you send money. Sounds simple, but you'll be surprised at how many businesses do not do this today. So the question is, how do they get into your email account? Well, that comes back to the classic tale of phishing. However, often the phishing is very, very specific and they refer to that as spear phishing. So they will target purely one individual or two individuals in a company in order to gain access with a carefully crafted email that will look genuine. It could be an office account, it could be a third party account, and they will get credentials from you from a method usually of a fake report, file, or something else that requires you to authenticate by logging into your account. Once they've taken your credentials, they then have full control over your access to the email, but you still have access to your email. So you're unaware that you're being monitored and someone else is logged into your account. There's a number of ways you can prevent this. The number one recommended approach would be to use a two-factor or multi-factor authentication. However, there's also other ways you can get around those. So just because you have a multi-factor authentication does not mean you are foolproof. I've seen examples of hackers using Google Mail, Gmail, and being able to access that with a multi-factor enabled. If your multi-factor goes to an SMS on your handset, your phone, there's easy ways to intercept that. And they don't have to be as sly as changing the SIM card provider and porting your number to a new network. There's actually vulnerabilities that exist in the mobile phone networks themselves. The way that the global roaming system works, which was designed 25 years ago, is very insecure. It's possible for me to register a fake SIM card as a roaming number on your account, receive your SMS token, and then drop it back onto your network. You would never be aware that you had been compromised or someone had intercepted your text message for your token code to log into a two-factor mechanism. So firstly, <laughs> recommend not using SMS as a multi-factor method. So, if you think that you're going to get a phishing email that looks fake, genuinely, these are the most common businesses that will be spoofed in regards to a phishing email. So it will be external to your organization initially. You will see Wells Fargo and Bank of America. Those are because primarily the United States is one of the highest targeted countries in the world in terms of population size for phishing campaigns. But you also notice that Google, Microsoft, Dropbox, PayPal, Apple, Adobe, Facebook, and Yahoo, common services us in Australia do use, are very often used as mechanisms to get your credentials. This is also a great example of why you should not use the same password for your Apple account or your Google account as you use for your business email Office 365 account. You should try and have a different password for every single service you use. And the best way to have this occur will be through the use of a password manager. There is many different options out there in the marketplace, and I'm not gonna recommend any option to you. Do your research, be diligent, and pick the right solution for yourself. Also use that in conjunction with multi-factor authentication that goes to your mobile device with a code generated on the device in an application, that is the most secure way that you will be able to avoid someone logging into your email address, even if you happen to give away your password. But if they do get in, what happens then? Well, I'm gonna talk about the dark web today. The dark web is an online marketplace and hidden area of the internet that exists out there. You would all be aware of the surface web today where you have your regular websites that you can search on your web browser. You'd also probably be aware of your academic databases 
your internal legal and financial records and databases that you keep in your companies in Trinet or on an offline database that's still accessible, but not through the public web. Additionally to that, there is then what's known as the Onion Router, Tor. This is a completely anonymous browsing network that is designed by the US military. It's been privatized and it's very often now used by cyber criminals. They use this to host marketplaces. In these marketplaces, you can pay for things with cryptocurrency, such as Bitcoin or about 5,000 other cryptocurrencies that do exist. And that means that you can go on there and you can purchase drugs, passwords, anything you wanted. That means that then the person has access to your credentials, your information. And what's scary about that is the credentials get sold there and they get used back on the regular web or even on your internal academic databases or your legal databases. How quickly can the credentials get used? We're aware as a business ourselves running security operations of an example where stolen credentials have been used in an attack and that has been 19 minutes from start to finish. So this is an example here from the February 2019. This is 12 months ago now. 19 minutes, all it took for someone to lose their password from a phishing attack. It was sold, purchased, and used to log in to the same system by a threat actor. That is almost so fast that even a professional security company has a very limited chance of protecting you against that. So if you're not aware of what you're receiving, when you look at your email and you don't verify that things that you receive are genuine, there's a very good chance that it might not be. The best part about this is that you think it might be a small example of someone doing $500,000 here, $100,000 there, and the bigger businesses would not fall for this sort of stuff. That's not true. I'm gonna show you one example here, just a very powerful example from Nika. Not sure how many of you guys are familiar with this, but this happened only five months ago. Nikai is a Japanese company. They have a US subsidiary and one of the email addresses was compromised. You can read through this, but I'll read it with you. So an employee in the subsidiary transferred roughly 29 million US dollars, roughly 45 million Australian dollars or 3.2 billion Japanese yen to the wrong bank account based on fraudulent instructions by a third party. It says they purported to be a management executive of Nikkei. However, this was not a spoofed email address or a fake email. This was a genuine work account that had been compromised and they had been requested payment. The individual did not go to check with any other method, whether it be Microsoft Teams, whether it be Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, a telephone call, or any sort of <coughs> mechanism to go and verify. Maybe they should walk down the hallway and speak to the person themselves in person if they're physically there. Nothing was done. That money was never sent again. And despite this company's efforts, the government of the United States' efforts, the Japanese government's efforts, the money will never be recovered. This business has lost $45 million in one transaction. And that is not the biggest example I could find out there just one that's quite recent. The largest one that you'll probably find out there was actually Toyota. Toyota paid more than $50 million US to the wrong parts supplier for car parts based off exactly the same thing. An email compromise where a parts supplier had changed their payment details purportedly. Toyota paid them for their lump sum payment and it actually went to the wrong place. <coughs> That's what I wanted to share with you guys today. Just a brief message around email compromises, around the factor that you need to double check everything you do, not just in terms of your password security, not just in terms of your multi-factor <coughs> authentication technology, but also in terms of you being vigilant that the emails you receive internally from your own bosses might actually not be real. And that this is the leading cause of loss online. You're not going to have 
a phishing attack that is going to lead to a ransomware attack that is going to cost you more than an email compromise. Because if you were to pay someone for you getting your data back, that is still going to be normally a lot cheaper than it would be if you sent your normal transactions for the whole year to the wrong account. Thank you. Thank you, Scott, very much. Now we're all too scared probably to ask you any questions, but I will check and make sure um, that there are or aren't any in the room. Please. And Christine, I'll have a quick check um, online as well. Um, any questions for Scott in relation to any of the things that he has mentioned or discussed? So, Scott, the, the question was, if you do, in fact, find that your email has been compromised, and I'm guessing like a personal email that you're focusing on more here, whatever, yeah, um, what are the steps that you take to, um, I guess, really try to bring back some form of security, right, um, apart from changing the password? The only thing you can do is to change your password. Once your password is lost, you're very vulnerable. The other thing you should also take into consideration is, where else have you used this password? I know everyone's going to say that they don't use the same password anywhere else, but that's not true. Everyone probably at some stage in their life has used their password somewhere else. What you should do in that case is probably go and actually enable multi-factor authentication as well as changing your password on not just your email service, but also on other services as well. Maybe your social media account would be a good place to start. And potentially also your bank account would be a great place to also check that setting. There's many ways mm. that you can use token authentication from Google, Okta, Microsoft, and many other providers out there that do not require an SMS token. And if you reset your passwords, make sure you use very thorough, strong passwords. Don't just go and change your password from Daisy 1 to Daisy 2 to Daisy 3, because it's very easy for me to guess the next number in the sequence of passwords that I've stolen from you is going to be number <laughs> four. <laughs> well, and I guess the thing is too, Scott, that you should just get into the habit of changing them regularly regardless, right, both personal and obviously our uh, organisational or corporate ones, whether or not we've been breached, right? Just keep changing them. Current thinking in that landscape's actually shifted a little bit. So mm -hmm. around... Probably around two years ago, the thought process was around a 30-day to 90-day password reset policy in most organizations. Now the thinking has actually shifted to having extremely complex passwords that you don't change very frequently. So maybe you change them once a year, but you use pass phrases. So you might say, dog, kettle, coffee, robot. Really long, really complicated. No one's ever going to guess it. It's quite easy to remember. In addition with that multi-factor authentication, the password strength is only important so that someone cannot do what's called a brute force attack. However, if the password is compromised and you do have a multi-factor mechanism in place, you're very unlikely to be compromised. You're also very likely to be aware if your mobile phone asks you, is this you logging in with a token request? And then you know that it's time to change that password. It's actually quite annoying because what happens is when you make someone change their password every 30 days or 90 days in a business, they go back to using Daisy 1, Daisy 2, Daisy 3, because it's very hard for them to change to a very complex password every three months and remember it. So they get lazy and sloppy. So you're actually much better off reducing the frequency of password changes and strengthening the length of the password. Um, for everyone else's um, knowledge, a brute force attack is when a computer system would just guess the password based off a number of known passwords and possible combinations of passwords. So the best advice there actually is to use longer and stronger passwords in conjunction with multi-factor authentication rather than frequency of changing the passwords because what that does is it forces onto less technical users a more high likelihood of them using poor password hygiene. And on that um, note, Scott, the ones that for those of us with an iPhone, um, you know, we, it suggests, I guess, strong passwords that you can use, that you can choose. Um, how good are they? Is, is it a good thing to be choosing those or not a good thing to be choosing those when suggested? Well, if you're talking about mobile devices specifically, it's actually recommended to use passwords over using your fingerprint. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is actually more in regards to law enforcement. Not that you guys might be doing the wrong thing, and I hope you're not. But 
if you are ever in a situation where someone wants to have access to your device and you use biometrics, whether it's eyes, fingers, whatever else it might be, there's an easy chance that someone could actually, against your will, detain you and then force the biometrics to be used, whether it's putting your thumb on the fingerprint reader of your mobile device, putting your eye against your laptop screen, it's a lot harder for someone to force you to divulge a password to them. Mm-hmm. Additionally to that, you can actually set your mobile device up to reset itself if the password is entered incorrectly a number of times. That means right. that if you're in a situation where you were held at gunpoint by someone who wanted your corporate information or police in another country you might have been visiting that you did not want to disclose anything to, you could actually disclose the wrong password and there's a high likelihood that person will enter it incorrectly and then wipe your device for you. That's a much better outcome than then just putting your finger on the phone and finding out that you've been helping someone in that country with a legal matter, which might then end up putting you in jail because that person might be in a country which has a government that's less inclined to want you to come and help that person. Thank you very much. I know that we're almost on time and I'm going to wrap us in about two minutes, but just wanted to before I I do that, Scott, to say thank you very much for taking the time to come to us um, from the States. We really appreciate it. And um, I'm sure there's going to be lots of people who will want to chat with you later. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. No worries. Feel free to connect to me on LinkedIn. More than welcome to. And I'm going to go and watch a rocket launch now from the Kennedy Space Centre. So I hope everyone has a great night. (laughs) Excellent. Congrats. Um, Thanks again. And thank you again to our panellists. I uh, wanted to just wrap by mentioning or reminding those of you that are members of the Legalpreneurs Lab um, that David very kindly is going to be doing uh, monthly follow-ups and monthly cybersecurity briefings uh, for you on different subject areas. So you would have seen what those subject areas are, but partly to keep it in the forefront of your mind, not to forget it, because it's really easy to go away from these sort of sessions and then Um, forget about what it is that we've all kind of learnt. So it's there for you to do that. And if any of you want some information about that, of course, please don't hesitate to contact me or to contact the centre. Um, So again, on behalf of the centre, thank you very much for those of you online, those of you in the room. I hope you've had lots to think about, to reflect on, to take away with you. Um, I know I can say on behalf of all of the panellists, because they are generous and wonderful people, that should you reach out to them, that I'm sure they will be very willing to Uh, chat with you. Clearly, for those of you in Queensland, we've heard that there's some great resources available for you um, through the Queensland Law Society. So don't forget uh, to tap into those as well. Uh, And on that note, bye. See you next time. (laughs) 